okay, I'm going to start because it's 635 and we should start. <laughs> so everyone is here. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here. Um, I appreciate you taking a little bit of your time on Friday um, during this challenging time. And, you know, thank you for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to put it in the notes or put it in the questions, probably in notes because it'll be easier for me to see that way. So welcome to Lark's big media of picture of Kid Media, a workshop for parents and teachers. Critical thinking starts now. Um, I run an organization called We'll Start Small, and we essentially support teachers, students, nonprofits, and schools in, um, in creating and supporting critical thinking, anti-racist literature, um, feminist literature, feminist media, and just supporting students generally um, through their critical thinking development. And typically we use literature, but we also use media such as the internet and things such as that. Okay, so. All right, so that just says who I am, Lark Sontag, child development theorist and writer. All right, so I also write about things also. Um, so does anybody have any questions or any comments or anything like that? No, no, okay. No one is born fully formed. It's through self-experiences in the world that we become what we are. And I think that's kind of part of what we're doing when we talk about media and when we talk about information. And it's not just our families that shape who we are. That's a, you know, a nice fairy tale that it's just mom and dad or just grandma or just your guardian who shapes who you are, but that is far from the truth. And we'll see that here as we go through these slides. So we, I'm gonna, well, <laughs> we're gonna skip. Usually we have a more of a kind of a back and forth, but because we have this webinar format, which is wonderful, and I love the fact that it's kind of my new toy and I really like it, um, but it, it doesn't, um, doesn't lend itself as much to the back and forth. Um, so if you can, you can put something in the notes or um, you can chat me privately. If you put it in the notes, I'll read it out. But if, you know, if that's something you can't do and you're busy right now, that's fine. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm going to say my favorite media as a child, just kind of like to explain what's happening. My favorite media as a child was The Little Mermaid. Um, and I loved it because I love the story of this person going from one part of the world to another part of the world or one land from another to another land. And I thought that was such a great tale. And I thought, oh, a great love story. I later on realized that it was sexist, imperialist. Um, there are so many bad things about Little Mermaid, but <laughs> I still love it. Um, I still love mermaids, but that shows you how strong even with information, even with people telling you, you know, about sexism, about, you know, about racism, about imperialism, about, you know, um, oppression, you're still going to be influenced by what information you get, especially if it's entertaining, especially if it's fun. Um, and so, you know, and I also, too, I want to talk about media. People always say, I don't remember the book I liked or the TV show. Well, I always said media. Everyone's always ashamed to say toy. You shouldn't be ashamed to say toy. That is part of, that's information. That's letting you, that, that informs who you are. And that is also media. Um, so what is media? Media is information that's not you, that someone creates to give you information. And the thing is that it's not always news. It's not always journalism. It's not always Editorial journalism, it can be video games, it can be toys, it can be memes, it can be Facebook, it can be Twitter, it can be Zoom. Anything that anyone creates and gives to you and informs you and gives you information is media. Um, and to me, there's no hierarchy in media. 
And I think a lot of times, you know, we're, we're talking, a lot of times when people are talking about children, they're talking about um, anti-racist books or anti-ableist books. But here's the thing. Let's all be honest. As a kid, yeah, you read a lot of books and they were amazing. But I'm sure you also played with a lot of toys. You also watched a lot of TV. You also played a lot of games. And we need to look at that. That's not just, you know, it's, we pretend that kids just read books and just hang out. Kids just read books and just listen to what their parents say. That's not true. That's not how it works. Um, and that's not realistic. And so we try here um, with this workshop, what we're trying to do is to try to get you thinking deeper about those toys, about those games, about those random things, those little games that you're playing on, 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 on your phone. Your kids are playing on your phone. And um, I'll see my Alice in Wonderland phone. So <laughs> I love literature, but I, you know, I do other things other than read books. So what is media literacy? Media literacy is the ability to identify different types of media and understand the message that they are sending. Um, and I think that's something that even adults need to learn. Like the word literacy, people always kind of go, okay, literacy is talking about reading and writing and understanding letters so that you can read words and, 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 and readers become writers, et cetera, et cetera. But media literacy is the ability to identify different types of media and understand the message that they're sending. Kids take in a huge amount of information um, from a variety of sources, viral videos, social media, memes, video games, advertising. And the thing is that someone creates it and someone has a reason to creating it. And you know, most of the time, not so sinister, <laughs> but sometimes it is. Um, and understanding the reason is the basis of media literacy, because I think a lot of times we do kind of go, well, you know, books are the only place we need to worry about a toy. How, how harmful is a toy? Well, it can be harmful. And then we're going to talk about digital literacy. Um, a part of media, um, digital literacy is a part of media. They're both included in the idea of information literacy, which is the ability to effectively find evaluate, um, you know, and use information. Digital literacy specifically applies to the media from the internet, smartphones, video games, and non-traditional sources like TikTok. Um, and so these things are super, super, super important because, you know, digital literacy includes the nuts and bolts of skills and ethical obligations and also, you know, the awesome opportunities and potential pitfalls, um, pitfalls, not pitfalls, pitfalls of digital literacy. I mean, I think one is, one thing people should know is your digital footprints. Um, I have a friend um, and she's younger. Um, she's 22 years old. Um, she just graduated from college and she's having a challenging time right now because she said some things when she was 10. <laughs> Unbelievable. She said some things when she was 10 years old. My, my Twitter account is 12, is I think 12 years old and my Facebook account is 11 years old. So she said things when she was 10 years old, which is like 10, 12 years ago. Um, on social media and now it's coming back to haunt her with a new relationship. Um, I also like to think about a situation where in a small town, it was a little boy who was obsessed with, um, with, with weaponry and bombs and, and, and making guns and things like that. He was a, not a bad kid. This was just something he was into. Well, unfortunately for him, there was a bomb that went off in his neighborhood. Um, I'm thinking probably the reason why he was into weaponry was because maybe that was kind of part of the community. People talked about it and he wanted to know how to make them. Well, the FBI knocked on his door because of the digital footprints of, of that situation. I mean, these are things that I don't know if people actually teach their kids because I don't think they even know them themselves that everything you do, everything you look at is something it you leaves a footprint on it leaves a footprint. So I mean that's that's kind of going off channel, <laughs> going off off track. But still, it's still an important um, 
wonderful thing to know about digital history. And we will get more into that later, okay? Let's see here. I'm just gonna go through some ideas in regards to who our kids are. And when they start to start to think about things about who they are, um, studies suggested that Canadian, English, U.S., and French babies aged six to nine years old associate happy music with members of their own race and sad music with members of another race. That's, you know, I don't know how you could teach somebody that. <laughs> but that's an interesting, something interesting. Another one. By three years old, it's popular belief that children naturally gravitate, well, this is three, well, someone is three years old. It is popular to believe that children naturally gravitate towards stereotypical behaviors, because, but that's false. The truth is children will play with anything until age three. So let's think about that. Let's kind of like sit and go, hmm, why will children play with anything until age three? Interesting. Another study says that several children, so several studies, and keep in mind, I'm trying to get recent studies. Um, show that children as young as three years old categorize people by race and develop pro-white, anti-black biases. These are pretty good people in the field, Abood, um, Hirschfeld, Katz. In a study of primary middle-class five-year-olds, the children felt members of their own group were kinder and less likely to steal. And, you know, why is that? Why is that happening? And I think it's, I just want you to, to kind of marinate on that because I know the answer that people are going to want to say. And then we're going to talk about the answer that maybe another, it might be another reason why this is happening. Research in the areas of media psychology and communication studies have suggested that television programming and movies can contribute to children's gender role learning in terms of their perception of gender typical occupations. Um, this study also talked about, it showed how, you know, what kind of people you should love, what kind of people you should have relationships with, and it was gendered because a lot of people kind of get their information like, oh, girls do this, and boys do this, and girls look like this, and boys look like this, and they're getting this information from media. Um, I just want to show that so you can, so you can know about that. And the study of white six-year-olds, implicit pro-white, anti-black bias was evident with self-reported attitudes revealing bias in the same direction. Okay, to so explain implicit bias, when we get to a certain age, we know that we're not supposed to be obviously racist. If you're in the metropolitan area, <laughs> you know you're not supposed to be obviously racist, obviously sexist. You're, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to at least give the feel that you are open-minded, but little kids don't know that. They simply act on what they think. So they knew the six-year-olds were implicitly biased, and if you asked them a question, they were like, yes, I do. Yes, I am um, um, pro-white, anti-black. Now, I'm not saying that the children are racist. I am saying that they, had, they were already prejudiced in that way. I think it's really careful that you start when you start calling like little kids racist or, or you know, it, it's, it's not a word you throw around. And I, I, would, I would be hesitant to say that. I would say prejudice. I would say, but, but, and also too, I would hesitate. A lot of people want to go, well, that's because their parents are racist. I, I you know, I'm, I'm going to push back on that, but we'll do that later. <laughs> um, in a study of white children aged nine to 12 showed greater automatic positivity towards white as opposed to black children. And people always, when I show them the study, they're like, well, what about black kids? Are, are they like, are they more positive towards um, black kids and, and more negative towards white children? And actually, sadly, no. Um, it, it was more than just, okay, about themselves. It was, it's a lot deeper than that. And I think the thing is, I always tell people this, I'm like, I, my mother's African-American, my father is Galician and, and, and Asian American. And the thing that's really amazing is that even I, my parents had much, had, many, had a lot of pride. We went to the African-American museum, we went to the Chinese American museum, we knew about our culture, 
we were very into our culture. My parents were very, you know, into like supporting me and supporting my culture. But every time I would go and pick a book or a doll, my mother would have to say, you need to pick a black doll. You need to pick a book with black people on it. <laughs> you need to like pick something other than white people. Um, and so I want to push back against this whole idea that, you know, it's just about the parents. Um, it's much bigger than that. According to a National Education Association, the school experience for fat students is one of ongoing prejudice, unnoticed discrimination, and almost constant harassment. From nursery school through college, fat students experience ostracization, discouragement, and even violence 2019. I mean, that is to me just unbelievable that in this day and age, we're still having these kinds of problems. We're still having sizeism. We're still having people pathologize people for not looking like Barbie, which is not, <laughs> that's not even realistic. Barbie's not even a realistic thing. All right. So this is just kind of like the all together. Um, but my focus was mainly on, um, on this one's race, but I like to put ginger and things like that on there too. But let's talk about systems. And this is a, this is my pushback on this whole idea. This is my pushback. Um, we, at times, we think that, oh, we are in control of our lives and, you know, this individualism that we have. And the thing is, is that our system, the way it's set up, is individual versus institution. And I'll have to say that probably as a child and just living in the US, the institution is the institution, the institution of culture, whether it's in school, whether it's in media, whether it's in TV, whether it's in games, everything you, that you get is supported by another branch of our institution. So the reason why three-year-olds start to, to favor different toys that when they're at home with mom and dad or grandma or guardian or mom and mom, they, they, their guardians are kind of like letting them play what they want to. But when you get to school, the school's like, here are the girl toys, here are the boy toys. Here, girls line up, boys line up. Girl bathroom, boy bathroom. Or even racism. The black kids go to this school. The white kids go to this school. And like, well, they don't do that. But when you do things like redlining and you make things geographically, you tie where people go to school to geographics and geography, and you have things like redlining, well, <laughs> you actually do. Um, you are actually, the institution is supporting racism, it is supporting bias, it is supporting these things. And then as you go to the school, as you say you grow up, not grow up, but you look at media. Oh, my teacher told me I'm supposed to play with this toy. Um, all the black kids live in this neighborhood. All the Latinx kids live in this neighborhood. Oh, when I go to the store, here's the pink girl section. Here's the blue boy section. Here are the boy toys. Here are the girl toys. Here are the black music. Here's the white music. Here's the Latinx music. So regardless of what your parents try to do or what you try to do as parents, as teachers, it's amazingly hard, amazingly hard to, to break the institution. And so I want to push back on this idea. Well, the reason why kids are biased and, and they're, they're racist is because their parents. No, no, no. That's, that's not, that's not, that's, a, that's such an easy answer because then we don't have to fix anything in society. We can just do what I'm doing right now. <laughs> we'll just give some anti-racism workshops. But that's why I don't really give anti-racism workshops because I feel it's institutional. I feel like it's, it's a thing that's too big for you to just do at home. But the thing is that if you know that this is institutional, there are things that you can do to change the institution. Um, I even want to say like what, here, in regards to textbooks. I mean, it's like say you're a teacher and you want to be anti-racist, um, anti-sexist, you want to be feminist, you want to be a womanist, you want to include everybody in your classroom planning. Well, unless you're planning curriculum, 
<laughs> unless you're picking the books, the standards, the tests, all these things. There's literally, you have, your individual self can do, and, and that's the whole thing too. They always tell you, well, just do what you can do. Don't worry about all this other stuff. Just, but you should, you should. You look at uh, this, this chart right here talks about textbooks. It talks about the fact that three problems and how historical narratives deal with race in school curriculum. And this applies to, to Latinx, Mexican-American, and African-American children. Relying on one-dimensional hero fiction narratives, positioning race as an essential, essentialized construct, and presenting partial and inaccurate representation of stories. Um, even in, in science textbooks, um, black and Latinx people were completely absent as, as, as scientists. Um, and Asian Americans were overrepresented. And that's not, that's not positive either, because maybe you're Asian American and you, my, my grandfather was a musician. Why, why are you being pushed into this? Oh, you have to do science. You have to do math if you're Asian American. And if you're black, you need to play basketball. This is, you know, and this is, these are our textbooks. These are our textbooks. This is recent information. This is stuff from 2018, 2009, 2017. This isn't old, old stuff. This isn't like, oh, this is, this is stuff from the 80s. No, no, this is stuff right now. This is stuff right now. And I want to talk about like in Nazi era Germany, people are like, well, I don't think games and toys or anything like that, they don't have they don't have objectives. They don't have objectives. Oh, I also want to say the kid that was into explosive was Jack Cubby Robinson, just in case, you know, Google, you want to do that because, you know, I know how it is. I'm, I'm very into Google. So, <laughs> um, but in Nazi era, era Germany, the Third Reich released war games that reinforced anti-Semitic views and encouraged players to invade nearby countries. That to me is just like, it, it boggles the mind. But the original Monopoly, I mean, think about games like Monopoly or Life. Like, well, if you didn't try hard, you just die. The original Monopoly created by um, Lizzie Maggie was a landlord game and it had rules for two different games, Anti-Monopolist and Monopolist. The Anti-Monopolist rules reward all during wealth creation, while the Monopolist rules have the goal of forming monopolies and forming opponents out of the game. Well, essentially, it was like, oh, if we all work together, then we could all have a nice life rather than, oh, if one person gets everything, then that's a good thing. They took out the whole working together cooperative part completely out of Monopoly, which is, you know, it just shows that it's agenda. I mean, I think that's the thing that's just so, so interesting is that I think a lot of people feel that toys are apolitical. They feel that media is apolitical. Games are apolitical. They are not. Um, Susan Lynn, director of the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood, argued that advertising in itself is harmful to children. Marketing targets emotions, not intellect. Lynn said it trains children to choose products not for the actual value, but because of the celebrity or the packaging of it. And the thing is this, what are products? I think so many times when we think about products, we're thinking like, oh, product is a lipstick or product is a phone or product is, you know, this cool little keyboard. Um, but products are more than that. Products are purviews, worldviews. Products are perspective. Products are aspiration. Like, oh, I want to be, um, I want to be thin. I want to be rich. I want to be popular. Um, these are things that our products do. Um, they're not just items. They're also teaching values. Those products exist because, oh, I need to make my, my lips are not okay. I need to buy this product to make my lips look better. Oh, um, I, in order to make friends, I need to have these cool toys and all of the latest games. Oh, in order, so, I mean, the products aren't just, oh, just about the product. The product is about so much more than just an item. It's about a whole way of thinking. And I think that's the thing that just, that worries me, is that people kind of just, you know, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, somebody put down aspirations. Do you, do you want to be? Great point. The beauty of the industry is a beast. The beauty industry is a beast. and It, it definitely is. And it starts when you're young. Um, and, and the thing, this is what corporate America thinks is ethical. Marketing towards children. Here are a few strategies in marketing of kids that can produce great results. Communicate with parents. Make sure it's easy for parents to see safety features and find out what their kids have been up to. <laughs> Encouraging spying on your children. Encourage kids to advocate for the brand. Let the kids back up your brand. Let the kids back up your brand. Produce original content. And I think the thing that's just so wonderful about that is like, think about Disney, think about McDonald's. Produce original, great content. McDonald's has great food. <laughs> Not to me, but to lots of children, it's delicious. Disney, Black Panther was made by Disney. People don't know that, but um, Disney is in a lot of, has their hand in a lot of pots. Um, and it's not just harmless. They do this to make money. And they also do this to push a certain kind of version of the United States that they, that they want. Um, you know, not helping the poor, um, making profit off of real estate, um, putting this sort of, oh, if you don't work hard, you deserve to die on the street. These are all the great stories, you know, are based in this kind of, kind of thing, moralizing poverty, you know, saying good people are rich because they worked hard. Um, <laughs> these are all the things and they're very dangerous. And they do things, they spend billions and millions and billions of dollars, pester power, we're relying on the kid to pester mom to buy the product rather than going straight to mom. Barbara A. Martino, advertising executive. Even how they advertise is sexist, racist, classist. They essentially go, if you don't have a mom, you're not worth talking to. So if you are a kid and you even see like these advertisements, you're like, wow, a good People, I want to aspire to be a housewife, or I want to aspire to be uh, a lawyer, or um, you know, a Wall Street baron, or something like that. I mean, even how the, even who they're talking to, they even show children who matters by who they are marketing to. If you don't have a mom to talk to, do you? That gets internalized. Like, oh, I don't have a mom. Um, but I'm kind of going off. I'm going off topic, but. It's just so important that people know how big this industry is and how dangerous it is. Advertising at its best is making people feel that without their product, you're a loser. Kids are very sensitive to that. So I think also too, what I want people to know is that when, they're ki when your kids are pushing you, pushing you to get things and, and pushing you to purchase things, or they're doing inappropriate things because they saw it on TikTok or Facebook, and you think, oh, they made this choice. I want you to think really long and hard because advertising, the people who are behind advertising, they have behaviorists, they have psychologists, they hire people like me, <laughs> child development theorists. You know how many toy companies have come to me and asked me to work for them? Hey, would you like to work for us and develop a toy for kids? There's a lot of money in this. And so your little one is not just being materialistic and you haven't failed as a parent. They've thrown billions of dollars to, to get your kid, get your child to <laughs> sign on to their product. Yeah, like I said, keep in mind, advertising doesn't just stop at objects. It includes purviews that, oppress, uh, that support oppressive forms of economics, children's books, toys, games, monopoly comes to mind. There are no apolitical media aimed at children in the United States. I don't say almost. There's never such thing as none. There's no absolutes. But generally, 
everything has a political agenda, um, <laughs> even if it's just supporting the status quo. Um, even if it's supporting status quo, it's still part of that agenda. Here's some fun facts and all the money that they spend and, and how useful it is. Um, according to YTV, kids and tweens report kids influence night breakfast choices, lunch choices, where to go for casual meals. These are 98% of the time. 34% of kids always have say on the choice of casual restaurants because of course, you want your kid to be able to choose things. So of course, you know, you, you say, hey, where would you like to, what would you like to get? Because you want to empower your kid. But your kid, but, they're, but these advertisers are manipulating that whole, you know, because they've already put the choice in your kid's head. All right, clothing purchases, software purchases, computer purchases. This is more than half the time your child who has been marketed to. Um, they're being put upon, preyed on by these people, and they're actually being, they're predators. These um, media corporate people are predators, um, and they are doing it to be malicious. Um, they spend 17, this is in 2009, they spend $17 billion coming for your kids um, <laughs> in every which way, every which way. And the thing is that a kid that's under seven has no idea what a commercial is. They think it's a TV show. And I think about that. Um, oh, and I already put that down. But, you know, so what can you do? My mother was like, I couldn't watch TV. She said she was very careful about the dolls I got. Um, she didn't even like me playing with dolls. I was not able to play with certain type of things. Her goal was to keep everything from me, okay? Even Doritos. I didn't, you know, even Doritos. I even tried Doritos since I was 18 years old. But is that realistic in this day and age? I think a better way <laughs> is to get kids to recognize what a commercial is you know like i said up until age seven children don't understand what a commercial is um they think that they're just shows that feature their toys especially now when we have the internet when we have two minute videos and one minute videos a commercial for a kid it's not a commercial because they're not used to the 30 minute shows that we watch or the one hour shows that we watch they're used to 15 minute bites 15 minute bites of shows and tv shows of what we watch. And I think that that's something that is, you know, something we should think, keep in mind, that this is a different world than when we grew up. So when your kid is watching, a, when a commercial comes on, even look at this way, even when a TikTok video comes on or a YouTube video comes on or anything that they're watching, what is this about? How do you know that? What do you like about it? What is it telling you? How does it make you feel? And I know it's like, well, they're little kids. They, they understand. They understand. You need to like, when you're watching things with your children or even playing games with your children, you're playing, say you're playing uh, musical chairs and at a party or something like that. And the, the, they're playing it in the way where they take the chairs away. And you can even say, do you think that's fair? Do you think that's a fair game? And if, you, and if they say no, be like, yeah, you're right. That game was not fair. I hate musical chairs. That's like one of my least favorite games. Um, so reinforce real lessons, real world lessons. Make the connection between a positive action and a real life. When you see something like a character being helpful and resourceful, say, that's nice that Joe helped Sam. Make sure they understand what they're watching. Little kids don't always follow how screen media uh, relates to the real world. Put out connections to the real world, familiar people, activities. Ask questions to check that kids are making sense of what they are seeing. Yes, you have to do this. I mean, this is something that's really, really, really important. Um, you know, it's, you know, they need to learn to think critically. As kids evaluate media, they decide whether the message makes sense, why certain information was included, what wasn't included, what were the key ideas. 
they learn how to use examples to support their opinions, then they can make up their own mind. I know when they're little, like, oh, that's, that seems unreasonable when they're little, but they're going to get older and you need to practice. You need to practice that with them. Have them practice critical thinking. And here are older kids, because I, like I said, this is for kids that are maybe like seven or eight. Encourage deeper thinking about commercials. Point out their favorite character used to sell products and ask if they're, if they're more likely to want something if, if, say, SpongeBob is on the packaging. Ask whether they think a food commercial is about healthy food or junk food. Ask for examples to support their opinions. Um, ask whether they think products work the same in real life as they do on commercials. Discuss real world consequences of characters' behaviors. Encouraging this kind of critical thinking will help them avoid imitating and accepting behavior that they aren't, haven't fully thought through. I meet, I am from California. And in California, we have what you call an up talk. Well, I've tried to get rid of it. <laughs> but when we talk, we go, hey. We always feel like we're asking a question. I used to have a really bizarre accent to people on the East Coast. But as children start to, to watch media more and people start interacting with them less, like in real life, I started to see, hear my accent in kids in Brooklyn, <laughs> in kids in Manhattan, in kids in, in Mississippi have my accent. And I started seeing behavior. Um, I started seeing behavior, um, smart aleck behavior that was similar to how people acted on TV shows. Um, and, you know, children, they're not trying to be horrible. Um, they're not trying to be harmful. Um, but this is happening. If someone put down, weird, my parents did that and my school did this in the 70s and they were challenging media and the, the messages went away in the schools. Kids want to fit in. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Kids, kids want to fit in, but it's like if no one's thinking that way, we're just looking at the books. Well, we're just going to work on not having racist books, but everything else can be racist and horrible. That's just how it is. <laughs> so we all have to kind of be on the same page with this. Um, so discuss real life consequences. If you're smart and nasty, if you have a smart mouth and you're nasty, what happens to people like that? Nip stereotypes in the butt. <laughs> or they said bud. Nip stereotypes in the bud. Point out positive, non-stereotypical attributes of characters. The princess is brave. The train conductor is kind. And I'm sorry, I'm still seeing stereotypes of African Americans. I'm still seeing stereotypes of Asian Americans. I'm still seeing stereotypes of Latinx and Mexican Americans. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, every time I watch something on like, any kind of media, um, Latinos are still mainly maids um, or gang members. It's really bizarre um, that we're still, that this is still happening. So it says, talk about TV shows and movies are made. Discuss the camera angles, the lighting technique, props, close-ups, long shots. All of these help kids to understand the different methods of, yeah, it just, it just helps children understand all these different methods. And it's like so, so important. So another thing you can do is the KWL. Which, if you are a teacher, I know, if you're doing K-12, I know you know. <laughs> you know what this is. But you can integrate this into media. After they're watching, after a, a child watches something or watches the video, said, what do, what do you know? Um, and then ask, where did they get the information or idea from? What are their sources? After asking, what did you want to learn? You can ask where all, where, where, where are you likely to find credible sources that could answer your question? After asking, what did you learn? Ask which sources were the most helpful. So figure out, show, start showing your kids who's creating what they're creating. Say, oh wow, this person owns a makeup line and they're telling you to wear makeup. Yeah, maybe they're doing a great job putting on their makeup, but also maybe they're trying to sell you a product. I mean, this sounds like, really kind of silly because of the little videos that we watch just like little kid videos like little 10 year olds like or even little five year olds like but this also goes into the bigger picture when you get older hey why is this candidate saying we don't need um rent relief oh because this candidate where his you know who's paying this candidate oh developers are paying his candidate 
what are developers? Oh, developers are people who make money off of people living in different places or living in houses. So they make a profit off of people via rent and mortgages. Oh, so, I mean, it's just getting kids used to thinking in that format. <laughs> and it's, as we see, it's kind of important that you know these things because of, you know, what's happening right now. Like, you know, so it's like, recognizing you have to recognize create like create media responsibility recognize your own point of view saying what you want to say and how you want to say it and understanding that your message has an impact and is key to effective ways you communicate so understand other people need to be understanding that also um when someone's creating something just try to figure out why what do they want you to take away from that media and I think that that's really, really important. Um, oh, and also too, what was left out? When, you know, if a person, I put it this way, say you're watching a really cute little story and they go, oh, this illegal, these illegal alien family, they are really hardworking, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, it seems like it's a good story. It seems like it's not racist, but they use the term illegal. You should probably, not you should probably, you should definitely go to your kid, hey, what does illegal mean? And, you know, they might, you, maybe they go, don't know. So you can tell them doing something wrong and you can say, well, it's not appropriate that they use that term illegal because they didn't do anything wrong. So you need to challenge what's left out, what's left unsaid, because these things are on purpose. They're not just accidentally leaving things out. Um, and we're going to kind of just, this is just for books, but the thing is that you can pick the, you can use these charts for, you can use these charts for TV shows and memes too, <laughs> not memes, but like little social media things. You can use it for that too. Like 10 quick ways to analyze children's books for racism and sexism, you know, um, check illustrations, but also too, you're looking at a book. Um, you're looking at a TV show or social media. Do all the people look alike? That's also another thing. Like, wow, do is everybody blonde? <laughs> Check the storyline. Um, is the child of color the one that forgives and is a bigger person? That can apply to social media, TV shows. That can apply to books and and in all kinds of media. Note the heroes. Well, you know, when you're watching something on TV and um, Notice how many times they show, they name black people or, or Latinx people in regards to being doing, doing crime and how much they are saying white people is doing crime. Um, just because of the, of the sheer population, there, there are more white people doing crime, but it's not being reported on the news as much. And it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense statistically because there are, ten, black people are only 10% of the population. So if every story about criminals is about 10% of the population, which of that, not everybody is breaking the law. There's some kind of thing that's going on there, but I mean, you should bring that up. Um, so these two charts, the racism and sexism in children's books, and also picking anti-ableist books, like the magical trope. I mean, there are a lot of magical trope books about neural and divergent people, um, which are not okay. Um, there are books where people who are, uh, are not, there are movies and, and shows about people who have, who will have, um, who, who are autistic and the person who's playing it is not autistic. So these are, you know, the things that we are applying to books, we can apply to all kinds of media. And with this, we're going to just like start wrap, we're going to wrap it up. So here are some resources, Embrace Race. Um, and the thing is that it talks about books, but it also talks about a lot of other resources too. Another one is Common Sense Media, my most favorite, favorite, favorite source um, for media. Um, and we need diverse books. And that's where you can get diverse books, diverse media. You can get all kinds of wonderful things. And I think that that's really important for you to you know to to try to the thing is this racism sexism ableism they all kind of go hand in hand so if you can 
pick some media, pick books, pick media, pick information that do not have those sexist, racist elements in it. And even fat, you know, fat phobias and all that stuff. You, you pick those kind of books, you're going to already help your child in regards to seeing what's okay. Sometimes it's hard to see what is not okay if you've never seen what's okay. Um, especially in all formats, you, they have to see what an okay, what a, an equity or just game looks like, what an equity or just TV show looks like. It can't just be just books because then they'll think, oh, books are where, you know, people who read books are less racist <laughs> than people who watch TV. And as we know, that's not necessarily true. Um, so, I mean, that's essentially kind of it. Um, if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. It's gotten like light to dark as, as I've done this presentation, but thank you so much. Um, I will, this, this is being recorded, so you will have a chance to see this and, uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, you come to my next, um, yeah, I hope you come to my next uh, talk, which is actually next Friday, when we talk about cooperative education. So thank you all. Um, if there's no questions, no questions, all right, then you guys have an excellent evening.